we're going to be singing is The Lion and the Lamb. Calvary Baptist and just look for someone you haven't seen in a while. And we got the newlyweds are back. Praise the Lord.
<laughs> David.
So the next song that we're going to be singing before my dad preaches is, um, it's called Here I Am to Worship. It's kind of, it's on the older side, but I figured that it was a good time to start singing this song today because um, God is so good and he's so beautiful and he's so powerful and sometimes we just come to church just to hear a sermon. I really just want us to focus on how beautiful God is and how impactful he is in our every single day of our life. Um, so join us in singing Here I Am to Worship today, guys. time of worship, I pray, Father, that you will be glorified in the singing and the preaching, Lord. I pray that um, you will, your Holy Spirit will come and that um, of the hearts and pe the minds of the people that are here to 
listen to your sermon today, Father. I pray that you will be glorified in the preaching, that you will bring clarity to my dad. Um, and I pray this all in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Michaela and Joanna and Shamia. Wonderful time. You did a great job. And, uh, truly appreciate all the work you put into helping us worship the Lord this morning. And now I'd like you to um, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 13. I know it's not 1 Corinthians, but it is uh, God's Word. And God uh, <clears throat> kept on putting this passage on my heart and mind as I was preparing in the 1 Corinthians passage. And uh, some of you who were here a couple Thursdays ago actually will hear it again. Um, put a little bit of a different take on it, but I apologize for that. But you'll need to hear it again anyway, because you're the you're what I as I shared with you on Thursday night. I want to see something come out of that, and um, remind you again about that. That I was reminded about it this morning by somebody else. So, John chapter thirteen, verses thirty-four and thirty-five. Um, let me read it, and then we'll have a word of prayer together. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Lord, we are at your mercy and we come to you and we pray that you will Minister to our hearts that you will encourage, correct, motivate, guide uh, every, anything and everything that we need as a church to be the people you want us to be, both individually and corporately as a church, that you will help us to become that. And so, Lord, as we look at these verses of Scripture this morning. May they come alive in our hearts and lives, and may you be glorified in the preaching of it and in the hearing of it, and most importantly, in the obedience of it. Uh, we need you, O oh God, uh, to have your way in our hearts. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so what we have in these two verses that we're looking at this morning is God's plan. This is God's plan for a community of believers that will eventually become the church. And so Jesus is giving these words to his disciples. Church has not yet been established. There is no church yet. That will happen in Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem, the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit comes upon uh, these group of believers that he's speaking to now. The Holy Spirit will come upon them and they will become the church. The, a, new, a new thing will take place. But Jesus is speaking to his disciples and this is his plan for a community of believers who will eventually become the church. And what these words are is that which distinguishes them. Is that which makes them different than any other group of people on the earth. It's what marks them as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is giving these words to his disciples, and it's what distinguishes them as followers of Christ. And so when we as believers listen to these words and apply them to our life, in other words, when we as believers love each other the way Christ has loved us, we're doing something so marvelous and so wonderful. We are we are actually putting the cross, the good news, the gospel, we're putting it on display. We are preaching to people who do not know Jesus Christ. When we love each other the way we're supposed to love each other, the way Jesus loved us, we are putting the gospel, the good news on display and allowing the world to see something. 
Something that they haven't seen in 2,000 years. When Jesus walked on this earth, the people who were around at that time saw God in the flesh. Another word for God in the flesh is the word incarnate, right? It is what happens at Christmas time when we celebrate Christmas. Uh, God, it, God came in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And according to what this says in, in, in the Gospel of John, when we love each other the way we're supposed to, we are actually allowing the world to see Jesus incarnated through our lives. People are seeing Jesus again as they did over 2,000 years ago when he walked on this earth. And my friends, brothers and sisters, that's God's will for our lives. That's why God has left us on this earth. And so these two verses that we're looking at this morning are the formula. They're the vision. They're the plan that God has not only for the church worldwide, but I want all of us to take this message personal. I've entitled it A Loving Community. That's where God wants us to become. He wants us to become a loving community. So it is the formula, it is the vision, it is the plan that God has, not just for the church worldwide and all followers of Jesus. Would, would you take these words personal this morning? They're words that Christ has given to you and to me for us to become the church he wants us to become, for us to become a healthy church. In my opinion, the greatest need that the church worldwide needs, and in particular, Calvary Baptist needs, is to become a more loving church. I have always pointed out to you as your pastor, over and over again, through different ways, I've pointed us, in, and I want us to become a great commission church, where the words that Jesus gave to his disciples to go into all the world and make what? Disciples, right? To, to build relationships with people and to make disciples. We, we put an emphasis on that here at Calvary Baptist where we offer discipleship, where, where you can be discipled one-on-one -on -one with somebody else and get into that relationship and be discipled and, and grow in your understanding of the Scriptures. And so we want to become a Great Commission church, and I'll keep on pushing us in that direction because I believe because those are the last words of Jesus, that they are important for all of us to abide by. But the great thing about what I'm saying this morning is I don't believe what I'm saying this morning is actually going to compete with that. It's not going to conflict with it in any way whatsoever. When I say that it's God's will for us to become a loving church and so that the world around us sees us, sees Jesus, the two things, the Great Commission which is to make disciples, right? And this point that I'm trying to get across this morning about becoming a loving community are not at odds with each other. They don't compete with each other. In fact, they're both saying the same thing. They are one and the same. When we love each other as Christ says we ought to love each other, we are becoming a Great Commission church because it says that the world will know the world will know that you are truly a disciple of Jesus. And so you can come to church all you want. You can pray. You can read your Bible. And those are all good things. But if you don't have love for one another, that's the true mark of what a disciple of Christ looks like. And so Jesus is getting ready to leave the world uh, from John 13 all the way to the end of the Gospel of John in John 21. Jesus is going to start preparing his disciples. I'm, I'm getting ready to leave. He's going to say it over and over again because for some reason the disciples weren't getting it. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to leave. And, and so they, they were clueless of what he meant by, what do you mean by you're leaving us? Uh, and so they, little by little, uh, this truth of him leaving and going back up to heaven was starting to get in their hearts and minds. They were starting to get it. And so he's preparing them as a loving Savior would do. He's preparing them 
for the time when he's getting ready to leave this world and go up to heaven. And so what is the advice that he gives? What is his, his first words that he's trying to communicate here in John chapter 13? Those words are, I want you to love one another. I want you to love one another. And so he says here, if you look at your Bible, these two verses, um, he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. I want you to first understand that these words are a commandment, not a suggestion. I believe that if you're here this morning and you are a child of God and you love the Lord and one of the things that you probably pray and you probably desire is to know the, the will of God for your life. Amen? Just nod your heads and we'll get done quicker, all right? We all want to know God's will for our lives. Can I just be blunt with you and just share this with you? If you're wondering what God's will is for your life, can I just make it simple for you? Really simple. God's will for your life and my life as a, as a believer is to love the person sitting next to you. Now, I, that might be easy if it's your son or your daughter, right? It might be easy if it's your husband or your wife. But let's try the person behind you or the person in front of you, all right? Most likely, uh, your son and daughter are sitting next to you, your wife or your husband are sitting next to you. But the person in front of you, the person behind you, uh, they are part of your family. They're not your physical family, but they are your spiritual family. They are part of the family of God. And God says, he's commanding you as a follower of Christ, that I want you to love that person. And so ask yourself, when was the last time you prayed for that person in front of you? When was the last time you prayed for that person behind you? When was the last time you thought about that person in front of you? When was the last time you thought about that person behind you? Love one another. And so this, this is a commandment. Uh, it's a commandment that's simple enough for a child to understand. We, we teach our children, maybe through song, right? This is my commandment, that you love one another. Am I the only one who knows that song? Uh, right? But we, we, we teach our children, and we teach them maybe through song. And it's, So it's, it's a simple command, right, that we love one another, that our, that our joy may be what? Full, right? It, it's, a, it's a simple command, but, but yet, if, if, you're, if you're tracking with me this morning, it's not, only, it's not just simple, but it's also profound. Because it's a commandment given to mature followers of Christ, or any follower of Christ, and it's profound in a sense that it's hard to understand, in a sense, what does he mean by love? And more importantly, and sadly, it's one of those commandments that are not obeyed. You know what I'm saying? It's not obeyed. It's not obeyed. For some reason, we do not obey it. So it, it, in some sense, it's simple, but it's profound enough for the most mature believer to somewhat today, even if you're sitting here, and I don't want to make you feel embarrassed, but it, I, I feel embarrassed when I'm looking at this and I think through my life. I don't follow this as I ought to. And so it's a command for us to follow. But you notice what he calls it? What kind of command is it? Just look down at your Bibles. It's right there. It's a new command. Uh, I'm, I'm giving you a new commandment that you love one another. Now, wait a second. If you are a thinking person here this morning, you, you're saying, wait a second, how can that be a new commandment? And if you read your Bible to some degree, has God n never told the people of God to love your neighbor as you love yourself? Leviticus 19, right? Uh, to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. So how can love be a new commandment. Think about that. What does he mean by calling it a new commandment? The Old Testament demanded you obey this. And so perhaps it's new because it's based on the new covenant, not the old covenant, which was under the law, that if you did not obey this commandment, the consequences would be severe, would it not be? Just nod your heads, man. Tracking with me? So it's a new commandment because it's based on not a, an Old Testament law, but it's based on a person. It's based on grace. It's based on the new covenant. And there's not a, there's not a, a death to follow for breaking this commandment. It's based on a person who demonstrated for you and demonstrated for me what love truly looks like. So it is new because it's based 
on the new covenant. It's based on a person, not on the law. So Jesus is telling his disciples and those who are following him that I am leaving you and I want you to love one another. And so the million dollar question is love. Tina Turner sang about it, right? What's love got to do with this? What is what does love look like, right? What does love look like? How do we love each other? What does it look like? And so look at your Bible and you'll see Jesus tells us what it looks like. Uh, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, here it is, as I have loved you. That's the way Jesus wants us to love. And so Jesus wants us to look at his life, look at the way he loved people. And I want you to love the way I've been loving people. And so if, as you look at the life of Jesus, you can even start right here in John 13. How did Jesus love his disciples? He chose a bunch of fishermen, right? He chose a bunch of guys who would follow him. And then that group got bigger and bigger and bigger. And right here in John 13, Jesus showed a selfless kind of love. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, this glorious Son of God. In John chapter 13, what does he do? He gets up from the meeting he's having with his disciples. He gets a towel and he, he takes part of his robe and he gets down on his knees with a basin of water and he starts to wash their feet. And, you know, they didn't have enclosed footwear back in those days. They had sandals, and so their feet and their legs would just be filthy, full of grime and dirt. And there's the King of kings and the Lord of lords living a selfless kind of life and humbling himself and washing the disciples' feet, one by one, washing their feet. And he says, I'm doing this for you. I am your teacher. I am your Lord. I'm washing your feet. I'm giving you an example that you should do the same thing that I've done. You're not greater than your master. And here I am showing you, and I want you to do these things. Blessed are you if you do what I am doing. And so he is showing them what love looks like. He is giving a selfless kind of love. And for you and I to look at that and say, I, I got to love that way. And, but if we're honest, we are so selfish at times. We're so selfish. We're always thinking about ourselves. And so Jesus gives us an example. This is how I want you to love the person behind you. This is how I want you to love the person in front of you. I want you to love them in a selfless kind of way. And what is Jesus doing? He's humbling himself and he's serving them. Is he not? That's what service looks like. Now, I'm not asking us to, to have a foot washing ceremony here this morning. <clears throat> I wouldn't mind washing your feet. I really wouldn't. But I would have a hard time you washing my feet, okay? And probably you would feel the same way. But this is what he's pointing us to. I want you to love as I have loved you. And so here is what I want you to write down, and I want you to, to, to think about this. A loving community called the church is known by their selfless love toward each other. A loving community called the church will be known by their selfless love toward each other. Paul elaborates on this a little bit in the book that he wrote in Philippians chapter 2. It's somewhat of a commentary. It, what does it look like to be a selfless individual? Listen to these words from Philippians chapter 2. There it is on the screen for you. God's word says to you and I, and this is not, this is not something that can be done through isolation. You can't live this scripture sitting at home watching TV or playing video games or just living your life by yourself. This is lived out in community, loving community. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, that's humility, let each esteem others. That's, that word esteem is the word value. Value others better than himself. And I, 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 I submit to you that I struggle with that. It's easy for me to do that for my wife and my children, to value them even I, more than I value myself. But God's asking me to do this for someone who is sitting in front of you or behind you or someone who might not even be here today that we should be thinking about and praying for that are part of this family, that we're not to think of ourselves all the time. That's what he says in verse 4. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests. So listen. 
God doesn't want you to stop looking out to you for your own interests. He says there, let each of you look out not only for his own interests. So God knows we're going to do that, and we ought to look out for our own interests and make sure we're taking care of ourselves and our family, but not only for our own interests, but also for the interests of others. This is God's word. So we become a loving community by living a selfless kind of life. But there's more to this. Not only this, as I have loved you, is it to be a selfless kind of love, but there's more. We're, we're to love as Jesus loved. And what does it look like? It's selfless, but it's also sacrificial. Is it not? Jesus sacrificed his life for you and for me. We love each other by sacrificing our own selves to love somebody else. This is brought out in another passage later on in the Gospel of John. Jesus says the same thing in John chapter 15, verses 12 to 13. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Same words, right? But he adds to it. Look at verse 13. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. I want you to picture something, a sacrificial love here. Jesus, the Son of God, hanging on a cross for six long hours. That's what it's saying, that he hung on a cross. Greater love has no one than this, than one to lay down his life. Jesus, though he was violently taken from this earth, Though he was grabbed and though he was arrested, though he was beaten, and all that is true. But he didn't fight. He didn't resist. He didn't say, no, I don't want to die. He loved you. He loved me so much. He allowed that to take place in his life. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Jesus Showed us great love. And it's interesting, as I was studying this, I've come to find out. I, I was curious of how Jesus learned to do this. How did Jesus know uh, how to love somebody else? Where did he learn that from? Well, in John 15, 9, it says this. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Do you see that? Jesus learned to love you and me and his disciples by seeing the way his father loved people. Jesus learned to love by looking at his father, and Jesus says, I want you to abide in that same kind of love that I, ha that I learned from my father. I want you to love one another. So we're to love each other in a selfless and a sacrificial kind of way. Now, I want you to be encouraged this morning that this is going to have a great effect in your life, in my life, in the life of this church, and the world around us. Do you realize that if we start to live this way and be, be, we become a loving community, there's going to be consequences for that. There's going to be results. There's going to be fruit. There's going to be a dramatic change that happens in the culture of this church. And not only this church, but in Dedham and, and the world around us. I'm, I really want you to get a hold of this. The weightiness of this message is that if we listen to this commandment from the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to have an unbelievable effect on your life, my life, the life of this church, and all around us. It's not going to be in a box. It's going to have an unbelievable effect. He, he, he says this in the next verse, in verse 35. What's going to be the effect? By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's going to have an effect. The world is going to see this. Others are going to see this. You and I are going to see this. It will be evident to all that we are Jesus' disciples. This is how people will know that you and I belong to Jesus, by our love for each other. By our love... We have for one another, the world and all those around us will know that we are his disciples. What an unbelievable evangelistic effect that's going to have when people see our love. When it says all will know, I want to point something else out about that. If you're here this morning and you ever struggle 
with assurance of salvation. If you ever struggle with knowing for sure that you are a child of God, this verse tells us how we know. Look at it again. By this, by what? By this love that we have. So if you have love in your heart for that person next to you, you can't explain it. Where did it come from? Because Christ lives in you. You have love for someone that you don't know that much. I remember when I first got saved, and I'm, I'm, I'm at another church called Calvary Baptist in Medford, New York, and I didn't know anybody. But when I got saved, all of a sudden, I had, a, I had an affection for someone that I didn't even know. It's, it's, sup, it's supernatural. It's, it's unbelievable. So the world is going to know, but you will know in your heart that you are a child of God. You will have confidence that you belong. You will know that your sins are forgiven. You will know that you belong to God and you're on your way to heaven. Now, that's missing. doesn't automatically mean that you're not a child of God. There are other things to think about. But it is something you should be concerned about. If you, if you don't want to be around God's people, if you'd rather be with the world, if you'd rather do what the world is doing and you don't want to be with God's people and you'd rather be mowing your lawn or fixing your house or whatever, you need to start asking yourself, why do I not want to be around God's people? According to this verse, we know that we belong to Jesus because we have love for one another. That's all I'm saying. And so that, let God's word speak to your heart this morning where it needs to be spoken to. And so this has unbelievable, profound meaning to all of our lives. That Jesus' life living in us and through us can have a dramatic effect in the world around us. What these words are saying to us this morning is Jesus is, listen, this is important. Jesus is giving the world permission to judge your life and my life. Jesus has all authority, right? He's given the world permission to examine and judge our lives. It's not by our church attendance. It's not by our Bible reading. It's by how we love one another. The world has permission to judge our lives. And when that kind of love flows within the congregation, the world will take note and will see it. Not only will the world take note and see it, but Satan will as well. And there will be persecution and there will be trouble. And there will be spiritual warfare because we are obeying the commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the early church fathers, Tertullian, I'm not sure if I pronounced his name right, but I have a lot of problems pronouncing different words, right? So I have trouble with that one, you know. Anyway, you figured out how to spell it, I mean, how to pronounce it. But he reported in the late second century a comment that he heard during his time. A comment that came from the pagan world, the unsaved world, the 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 those who were outside the church. And this is what they were saying. Listen to this. Behold how these Christians love each other, how ready they are to die for each other. That was happening in the second century, and, and, and it got back to him. Like it would be kind of like, hey, Pastor Loop, I want to tell you something. that uh, you know I live across the street from the church here, and I just want you to know that I've, I've seen how... You guys love each other and how you'll be willing to die for each other. Wouldn't that be an unbelievable testimony? That was happening in the, in the second century. The, the mutual love that the church had for each other was like a, a magnet that was drawing the people from the world to want to know more about this thing called the church. And that can happen today. That can happen today. And so how, do, how can we do this, guys? How can we love like Jesus? Well, the first thing I want to say to you this morning about this is this will never happen. Apart from a radical transformation of our hearts from the Holy Spirit, it's never going to happen. In other words, until the Holy Spirit really moves in your heart and your life as you take that step of obedience to say, I'm going to love the way God's Word says I'm supposed to love. Until that happens, it's not going to happen. Until we submit and love the way we're supposed to love and that radical transformation takes place, the power of the Holy Spirit. So some of us, some of us need to 
to pray about this and say, Lord, what's stopping me from being obedient to this commandment? Would you change my heart so I would love the way Jesus, your son, tells me to love? Would you pray for that and examine, ask God to examine your heart? And also, secondly, I, I, I would want to know how to love like Jesus. And so this is what I would tell you to do. Reflect on how much God loves you. Do you believe God loves you? I'm sure you do. Reflect on how much God loves you. Because the Word of God says that we love because He first loved us. Ever hear that before? That's from 1 John. We love because He first loved us. So if you want to grow in this aspect of your Christian life to love your brother and sister, would you reflect on how much God loves you? Reflect on how much He loves you because we love because He first loved us. Thirdly, we can learn to love like Jesus by seeing the profoundness of our forgiveness. By seeing the profoundness of our forgiveness. There's a story in uh, Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 7. You don't have to turn to it. I'm just going to read a few verses from it. But there's a story here of a woman. She's not just any girl. She's a, it's called, she's, the title of this section of Scripture in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 to 50 is about a sinful woman. Um, Jesus is invited to the home of the Pharisee, a Pharisee, and he's sitting there eating with this Pharisee, and then unbeknown to him, a lady comes in and kneels down beside Jesus. And she begins to take her long hair and, and put it into some fragrant oil. And she takes that her hair that's full of oil and she begins to clean the feet of Jesus. She's doing this as Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And he's just letting her do it. And as this is happening, the Pharisee who invited Jesus over his house is looking at Jesus and judging him. And he's, he's like, if this guy was truly a prophet, he would know that this is a sinful girl and he shouldn't be letting her do that. And so Jesus hears these words and he turns to this guy, his name is Simon, who becomes a follower of Christ later on. He goes, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he, the teacher, and he says, okay, go ahead. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. So catch the picture in your mind. These guys owed this guy a lot of money. One of them only owed 50. The other one owed 500. Big difference, right? And he forgave them both the debt that they owed. That's the picture I want you to get. And so he's, Jesus says, tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? In other words, which one of these guys who were forgiven the debt that they owed are going to love and appreciate that debt, that, that master more? And so this guy's pretty smart. Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave the more. And Jesus says, hey, you're thinking pretty good. You rightly judge that. And then he turned to the woman and said, and he said to Simon, he turns to the woman, he says this to Simon. Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair, the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet. Since the time I came in, you did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Now, here's the clincher. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little was forgiven, the same loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. I want you to understand something, that she's not forgiven because she loves Jesus. She loves Jesus because she's forgiven. And the more you see how, how messed up of a person you are, the more you're going to love Jesus. The more you see your sin and how sinful our sin is and what it costs for Jesus to hang on that cross for six long hours, the more you're going to love Jesus. So in other words, if you don't understand 
the profoundness of your forgiveness. That is the reason why you don't love the way you ought to. That is the reason why I don't love the way I ought to love, because I don't understand what it costs for God to forgive me of my sin. And so she loved. Lastly, we learn to love like Jesus by knowing what love truly is. Love is not just words. Love is defined not as a feeling, not, as a, not, just, a, not just an emotion, but we love through truth and deeds. Through truth and deeds. A commentary on the verse we're looking at this morning, written by the same apostle, is found in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18 say, says this. By this we know love. It's a commentary. Because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So if he didn't say it once, now he's saying it twice. How do we love each other? By will, be willing to lay our lives down. And then he goes on to give a little more commentary on this. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in that person? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So that's where the rubber meets the road. If in our hearts we know there's a need and we shut up our hearts from that, that's a good indication that there's love missing in our hearts. But we need to put this into practice because we, most of us, I, I would say, we know this is the way we're supposed to be living. And so I want to put some practical steps to foster this in our lives, to, to see how we can change the culture of our church to be a culture of a loving community so that it affects not only this church but affects Dedham and the world around us. Are you tracking with me, brothers and sisters? Because I want to make this more personal and apply this to our lives how we can make this a priority in our lives. Well, first of all, we first need to see that we ought to be a loving community. Would you first arrive at that point in your life that you realize that we ought to be a loving community? We ought to be a loving community of believers. And one of the things I try to do every the first Sunday of every month is just to remind us of the covenant that we've made together as a church. So the first of every month when we're having the Lord's Supper, just take a look at that covenant, would you? As a member of Calvary Baptist Church, there's a covenant that we've made together that reflects the kind of church that we're striving to be. Secondly, in order to foster this kind of community, we need to build relationships with each other. And in order to do this, this is going to be really profound, and you're going to say, well, why didn't I think of that? We need to spend time together. We simply need to spend time together. And I thank the Lord. I, I, I got a good report. I wasn't able to, uh, some, uh, somewhat of an emergency came in my, in my family that I wasn't able to make the Friday night fellowship, the couples fellowship. But Henry told me it was a great turnout. That a lot of people came out to that fellowship. And um, we need to do more of that. We have a, a men's Bible study that meets every other Monday for fellowship and the study of God's word. We have a women's Bible study that meets every other Wednesday for the ladies to get together. So now we have a couple's time where couples can get together and, and spend time in God's Word. And then every Thursday night, every Thursday night, we have another opportunity. And so these are all these opportunities for us to spend time together. And those are more formal times. But I want to submit to you that we can have also informal times. And that's what I want to share with you this morning, how we can foster these kinds of relationships by spending time together. Because I want it to become not just getting together and having fun, which is nothing wrong with that, but I want us to build gospel-centered relationships. Gospel-centered relationships. And I'm going to give you some practical ways of how we can do that. Both of the ways that I'm going to give to you this morning need to be intentional on our part. You, you are going to need to be the one who takes the first step towards somebody else to make it happen. Would you pray about that? Here's the first way. It's called mentoring relationships or discipleship relationships. If you're a leader here this morning, 
And you're probably saying, well, I don't know. Am I a leader? Huh. Let me think about that. Well, let me back up a little bit. A leader here at Calvary Baptist is somebody who has gone to our discipleship ministry. If you've been discipled by somebody else, if somebody spent some time with you and discipled you, then you are automatically a leader here at Calvary Baptist. You might not be doing leadership activity, but you are a leader. And so I want to challenge you this morning to not leave what you learn to yourself, but look for someone to build your, what you've learned into their life as well. Would you do that? Would you pray? And what I want to point you toward is toward a young person. Our young people need an older person in their life besides their mother and father who is constantly telling them how they ought to live their life. Now that they want to start spreading their wings, would you come alongside a young person you've been discipled, even if you have been, have not been discipled, but you know enough about the things of the Lord, would you look for a relationship to pour your life into? Now, it doesn't have to be a young person. It could be someone that you're a friend to here at Calvary Baptist. Would you consider just getting together with them? It doesn't have to be a formal time. It could be very informal. Just get together for a cup of coffee, co- coffee, excuse me, a cup of coffee and what I would like to suggest that you do is take one of the books that we have in the library back there. We have plenty of books back there that are good. And just read a chapter together. You don't even have to prepare for it. Just grab the book and say, hey, I'll get, let's get together for a cup of coffee. And we'll, I'll take, we'll take turns. I'll read a chapter to you, and we'll discuss what we just read. It's a gospel-centered relationship that anybody can do. But if you're a spiritual leader, I really challenge you to consider that. So it could be a book from that library. It also could be a book from the Bible. Just read a chapter. Every time you get together, read a chapter of that book of the Bible together, out loud, and then talk about what you just read. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to be a Bible Bible college student. You just got to know the Lord. Amen? And you could do that. Secondly, this has to be intentional as well. If you you come to me and you say, Pastor, I want to, I want to, know how I can serve here at Calvary Baptist Church. And I I hope everybody wants to serve in some capacity. Here's how you can serve. By showing hospitality. Being a hospitable person. There's a passage in Romans chapter, um, Romans chapter 12. I'm going the wrong way. In Romans chapter 12, let me just read this passage of scripture here because it defines what love is and then it gives examples of how we all ought to love in Romans chapter 12 starting in verse 9 it says let love be without hypocrisy don't be phony don't be fake in love abhor hate what is evil cling to what is good practical advice right be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor given preference to one another not lagging in diligence fervent in spirit Serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually, steadfastly in prayer. Now, here it is. Distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Given to hospitality. What is hospitality? Hospitality is just you going up to somebody and saying, hey, how can I pray for you during the week? To be hospitable, right? But then take it one more step. Would you like to go out and have a meal together? Would you come over to my house and have a meal? Be hospitable. As a matter of fact, even in Hebrews chapter 13, this hospitable nature is not supposed to be just for one another, but it actually should overflow from our lives as Christians to even strangers. Hebrews 13 says, Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers For by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. And so God's going to put people in your life to see if you're going to be obedient and be hospitable. And you know what? A miracle might take place. It might even be an angel. Do you believe that? That's what the Word of God says. God will send an angel to see if you're going to be obedient, to be hospitable, to take that person out for a meal, give food to a homeless person. Help out people who are in need. It's not just love in word, but it's love in truth and it's love in deed. Every person here can be involved in in being a hospitable person. 
And so a thir- couple Thursdays ago, I challenged the folks that came out to church that, that Thursday night about this. And this is why we're, everyone can do it, all right? And so if one person forgets, the next person can remember. Today, would you walk up to somebody and just simply say, hey, my name is Joe, right? My name is whatever. And uh, introduce yourself to that person and say, I'm going to pray for you this week. Is there a, a specific prayer request that you have that I can pray for? That's how you build a relationship with someone. Just say, can I pray for you during this week? Would you do that today? Just walk up to the person, introduce yourself to them, and ask them if you can pray for them during the week. And then when you meet them next Sunday, ask them how things are going. And you never know. Unbelievable friendships and relationships are going to result from that. And so let's not be a Sunday-to-Sunday church anymore. Let's develop a culture here at Calvary Baptist Church that we love one another and become a loving community. It's God's will for our lives. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in other words, you don't know if you were to die right now, you don't know for sure that you'll be in heaven. You've never trusted in Jesus Christ. You've never received him into your life. Would you do that this morning? Would you bow your head when we close in prayer? Would you ask him to come into your heart? Would you submit to him to be your Savior and to be your Lord? God will never let you down. He'll guide your life. This morning, if you need to take that next step of committing to be more loving towards someone maybe behind you or in front of you, make that commitment this morning to love one another as Christ has loved you. Would you bow your heads as we end this message and just think about God's word and how you can take the next step of of obedience and apply it to your life. Father, I I give you thanks and praise for the words of Jesus. And I pray that they're not just words on a piece of paper, that no one here will say, that was was nice. We would all reflect on our lives. We would all take steps of obedience and apply the truth of what we heard. Make us a more loving community 